Patrick from my eye tutor here and I'm feeling it today, I'm feeling it. We've got a bit of stats and mechanics and we're doing paper two of Edexcel June 2018. So I've actually just smashed out paper one. I'm having a good day. Right, so question one, we're starting with stats, okay? And it says, a company is introducing a job evaluation scheme. Points will be awarded to each job based on the qualifications and skills needed and the level of responsibility. Pay will then be allocated to each job according to the number of points awarded. Before the scheme is introduced, a random sample of eight employees was taken and the linear regression of pay and points was this. So it's a straight line, isn't it? And it's basically saying, given a certain amount of points, you have X, how much are you gonna get paid? So here, it's basically saying that, what would this graph kind of look like? The gradient's positive, the number in front of the X, so, so it'd go up, wouldn't it, basically? So the correlation here would be a positive correlation. In other words, the more points you have, the more pay you're gonna get. So that is what you would say. You would say that this is positive. We don't have any data about like how strong it is. Positive, positive correlation. That's the, that's the only way that we can describe that. As X goes up, Y goes up. Part B says give an interpretation of the gradient of this regression line. Okay, so let's think about it, right? Every time X goes up by one, y is going to go up by 4.5, isn't it? It's going to add another multiple of 4.5, meaning that for each extra point you get or have, each extra point, what does that do to your pay? Well, it's going to make y go up by 4.5, isn't it? And then this just says pay. Is this pay per hour or...? It just says pay. It literally just doesn't tell us, does it? <laughs> but, um, so, yeah. So, I mean, each extra point will correspond to an extra 4.5 or £4.50 in pay. Makes sense. Part C, just words for this one, mate. It's easy. Explain why this model might not be appropriate for all jobs in the company. Well, imagine you had like 10 points. How much, how, you know, how much money would you get? You'd get y equals 4.5 times 10 minus 47. But 4.5 times 10 is 45. So with 47, you get minus 2. Don't know about you. I don't know about you. But I probably wouldn't work for negative money, right? You go, you do your day's work with your 10 points, and then at the end of the day, you've got to give them two quid. Nah, I don't think so. So that's why it's not appropriate, right? So I suppose, actually, for every value less than 11, so for x less than 11, like if you've got less than 11 points, you're going to have a negative pay. Doesn't make sense, does it? So negative pay, no chance, mate. So yeah, you know, there would have to be certain boundaries and conditions on this, right? Maybe this would only be valid for x greater than 11 or something like that. But yeah, that is why for the jobs that you got 10 points or less, probably not too appropriate. Question two. Factory buys 10% of its components from supplier A, 30% from B, and the rest from supplier C. It's known that 6% of the components it buys are faulty. Of the components bought from supplier A, 9% are faulty, and of the components bought from supplier B, 3% are faulty. Find the percentage of components bought from supplier C that's a faulty. Right. Uh, it's quite tree diagrammy, this, isn't it? Because you've almost got these two variables. You've got like which factory they've bought it off and then each one of those factories is like if it's faulty or not. So we could probably represent this relatively nicely with a tree diagram. If we took like factory A, factory B, factory C and then like faulty, not faulty, faulty, not faulty, faulty, not faulty, I reckon we could probably fill this in. So if I was to say A, B, C, we know the probability of going to each factory because it says 10% from supplier A, so that corresponds to 0.1 as a proportion or probability. We have 30% from supplier B, so 0.3, and from supplier C, well, the rest. So if I have 0.1 and 0.3, that's 0.4, there's 0.6 left. Of the components bought from supplier A, so given that I'm on this tree, 9% are faulty. So if I say faulty, not faulty, faulty, not faulty, faulty, not faulty, then the probability that I'm from, you know, given that I'm from A and I'm faulty is going to be 0.09, right? 9%, meaning 91% are not faulty. 
from supplier B, 3% faulty, so 0.03, so you have 0.97 that aren't faulty. And then the question is, what is this probability here? Okay, so the piece of information that we need to cash in is the fact that in total, 6% of the components are faulty. So imagine I had P, right? And then I just, and I didn't know that 6% were faulty. And I said to you, find out the probability that a randomly selected component is faulty. What you would do is you would look at all of the different trees, uh, like the kind of branches down here of the faulty ones. So you would say, ah, oh, A and faulty, what's the probability of that? It's gonna be 0.1 times 0.09. And then you would say B and faulty, what's the probability of that? It's gonna be 0.3 times 0.03. And then you would say C and faulty, what's the probability of that? It's 0.6 times P. And then you would add all of these up and you would go, ah, because you, you know, it's kind of like the and rule and the or rule and you say, ah, okay, this is gonna be the probability that it's faulty. So that's what we do here, but we just have the unknown in a different place. So 0.1 times 0.09 is gonna be 0.009. I'm gonna add that to 0.0 three times 0.03, and then I'm gonna add that to 0.6p, and I know that that total probability is gonna be this 6%, or 0.06. So I've just got an equation for p now, haven't I? So let's work out all of this stuff. So if I have 0.009, and I add that to 0.3 times 0.03, I get 0.018. I'm then gonna bring that over to the other side. So I'm gonna get 0.6p is equal to 0.06 minus 0.018, and then getting p would just be dividing by 0.6. So p is gonna be this stuff here, all over 0.6. And that is gonna get me the following, 0.06, minus 0.018 over 0.6 is gonna get me seven over 100 or 0.07. Nice. A component is selected at random. Explain why the event, the component was bought from supplier B, is not independent from the event the component is faulty. Okay, so there's like a, a proper mathematical way to explain this. And then there's kind of an intuitive way. They're telling us to explain. So maybe we should go with the more intuitive way. But I don't know, you could go intuitive way, but it's definitely worth mentioning this kind of condition for independence because that's really what they love testing here. So essentially, if probability of A, where, where A and B are two events, if the probability of A and B happening is the same as the probability of A multiplied by the probability of B happening, then A and B are independent. So any time in, I just forgot to write, man, independent, any time you see this word independent, think of this equation. Because you can just check, can't you? You can say, okay, well, component was bought from supplier B, let's call that B, and then component being faulty is A. So I know all of these things. I know that the probability of the component being faulty, well, I've worked it out here, haven't I? It's, no, we're told it, it's 6%, so it's 0.06. Um, the probability that it's from supplier B, yeah, that's just not, this is 0.06. The probability that it's from supplier B is 0.3, 30%. We need to check, so don't set it equal to, check if it is equal to, what is the probability that it's from supplier B and faulty? Let's look at our tree diagram. From supplier B and faulty is 0.3 times 0.03, isn't it? So all I need to do is work out what 0.3 times 0.03 is and see if it is equal to the right-hand side. If it is equal, then they're independent. If it's not equal, then not. So 0 0.3 times 0 0.03 is 0.009, and 0 0.06 times 0.3 is 0 0.018. So these things are definitely not equal, are they? 
therefore not independent. And then think about think about it intuitively, like the component was bought from supplier B and the component is faulty. The different suppliers have different rates of faulty components, right? So obviously, you know, the probability of this thing being faulty is going to depend on if it was from supplier B or not, right? If one factory has half of them faulty and one factory has a third of them faulty, if I ask, oh, what's the probability of it being faulty? Well, it's definitely gonna matter which factory it was from. So they're definitely not independent here um, because they depend on each other. Question three, Nasir is playing a game of two friends. The game is designed to be a game of chance. So the probability of Nasir winning each game is a third. Nasir and his friends play the game 15 times. Find the probability that he wins exactly two games. So what's kicking off here, okay? We've got a repeated experiment. We've got this game, haven't we? It gets played and then gets played again a fixed amount of times. And then there's really only two things that can happen in this game. Either Nasir wins or he doesn't. This is a classic binomial, isn't it? If we were to call the amount of times he wins x, this would be distributed binomially with 15 trials and a probability of success on each trial, so winning the game, of a third. At this point, it's quite easy to use our calculator because now part i is just asking us the probability x is 2. Get your calculator out, press menu, press 7 for distribution, and I want binomial pd. So this is probability distribution and it just gives me these equal to probabilities variable and put in x is 2, n is 15, and p is a third, so 1 divided by 3. Boom, got your answer. Straight in, 0 0.05994 dot dot dot. Let's round this to 3 sig fig, so 0 0.0599. Easy as. Now I want the probability that x is greater than 5. What different values can x be here? It can be 0, he can win no games. It could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, dot, 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 all the way up to 15, right? It's discrete. It can't be anything in between these. It can only be whole numbers. What I want is the probability is greater than 5, so it's anything over here, you know, 6, 7, 8, 9, etc. Now, my calculator can't tell me that. My calculator only tells me like less than or equal to probabilities. But can I use a less than or equal to probability here to get this probability? I think I can, because the whole thing must equal one, okay? Because it's probability. So surely if I got this bit here, took that away from one, that's just gonna leave me with the bit that I want here. So if I was to do one, minus the probability, what is this? It's the probability that x is less than or equal to five, isn't it? If I was to just do that, then I'm sorted. So I now want the binomial CD because that's cumulative distribution because that gives me less than or equal to, right? Like all of the probabilities are accumulating. So distribution go down to binomial CD and then it's the same kind of thing, right? Variable, put in your x value, which is now five. N and P are the same, boom. So that's going to be 1 minus and then 0 0.61837, blah de blah de blah I don't care because I'm going to just do 1 minus ants now. So go menu and 1 to get out into the normal mode. 1 minus ants, boom. 0 0.3816, blah de blah de blah 3 sig fig, 0 0.382. Nice. So when I say now comes along and he goes, you know what? I've got a method to help me win more than a third of these games. So he thinks he's increasing his chances. To test this claim, the three of them played the game 32 times, that sounds dead, and Nasir won 16 of these games. Stating your hypotheses clearly, test Nasir's claim at the 5% level of significance. Right. In this new experiment, if we were to call the amount of games Nasir won as Y, what would the distribution of y be? Well, it would be binomial again, wouldn't it? We've got 32 trials, a third? Well, no, right? Because isn't this what we're testing? Yeah, we used to think that the probability of success was a third, but now Nasir's come along and he goes, no, actually, I don't think it is a third. So really, 
We can't write a number here. We don't know what it is, do we? That This is the very thing we're trying to test. So why don't we call this P? It's unknown. And then we can state our hypotheses in terms of P, can't we? So, you know, everyone else thinks, well, you know what, nothing's changed, right? Isn't P a third? And then Nasir comes along with his alternative hypothesis and he goes, you know what, actually, no. I've done that, I've got some tactics, I've been doing my research. I think that I now have a better chance of winning the game, i.e., I think that the probability of me winning a single game is now more than a third. So, he won 16 out of 32, which is half. So you might instantly think, well, it's pretty good evidence, right? But we need to actually test if that result is statistically significant. So here's what we do. We say, okay, you know what? Let's assume H0 is true. Let's assume that all of his mates are right, all of the naysayers, and that the probability of him winning a game is still just a third. What would be the probability of Nasir winning this many games or more if that was the case? So if Y was just distributed binomially with 32 trials and then the probability was still a third, what would be the probability of me getting a result as crazy as Nasir did? So in other words, what would be the probability of me winning at least 16 games? Because surely, like, if this probability is only a third, shouldn't be too much, right? And then we can say, ah, well, you know what? This is going to be significant. So, so let's show you what we mean here. So the probability that y is greater than or equal to 16 here, how are we going to work this out? Same as we did up here. My calculator doesn't give me this. Yours might. Mine doesn't. I know. But it's going to be 1 minus the probability that y is less than or equal to 50. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go menu. 7 binomial cd variable. Now x is going to be 15. n is going to be 32. And p is going to be 1 third. Now this gets me 1 minus 0.9623 blah de blah de blah. Go back to the normal mode and do 1 minus hands in your calculator. This gets me 0 0.0.3765 dot dot dot. Okay. What is the significance of this? Let's think about it. If H0 was true, so if the probability of me getting, of, you know, of just winning was just a third, the probability of Nasir getting a result as crazy as he did, right? He, let, he did win 16 of them, that happened. The probability of that happening would only be 0 0.0365. In other words, that's about what? That's about 3.77%, right? That's a very low probability. In fact, that is lower than my significance level. Because this is lower than my significance level, you know, we want it to be that short, to within like 5% or 95% certainty. And he passed that. He won so many games that the probability of a result like that happening, if this was true, would only be 3%, wouldn't it? Which means that he can be pretty sure that, you know what, maybe the probability is just greater than a third. So this result here has given Nasir sufficient evidence to reject H0 here. Because you've, you know, you've, you've cracked that, you've gone past that significance level. And I believe that'll do the job for question three. Question four. Helen is studying the daily mean wind speed for Camborne using the large data set from 1987. The data for one month are summarized in table one below. Okay, so we've got wind speeds and then the amount of, um, you know, the frequency of the amount of days I believe this will be that had that mean wind speed. Calculate the mean for these data. Okay, so we can use our calculator for this. The first thing worth noting is that the first thing is an NA. So we just, there's 13 of them, but we don't know <laughs> what value it is. So we just clearly aren't gonna be able to include that in our calculations. Um, it, it'll mean that we just have a slightly smaller sample size, but there's nothing we can do, can it? So let's use our calculator. I'm gonna press menu and then six for statistics. I can press one variable now, because we're only studying one variable. Put in your X values, so the wind speed values, and then we're gonna need the frequency column as well, so you're gonna make sure you need to do that beforehand on the setup, and then you put in the frequencies. So the X values are gonna be six, seven, eight, nine, 11, 12, 13, 14, 16, 
and then loop back up and put in the corresponding frequency. So it's going to be two, three, two, two, three, one, two, one, two. Sick. Now press option. It's on the top left, just under the shift button. Opten. One variable calc, right? One variable calculations. And it just gives it you all. So my X bar is my mean, and it tells me that this is going to be, well, 10.2222. Let's go three sig fig, so 10.2. And then we actually want the standard deviation as well, and that tells it straight away it is this old jobby there. So that to three sig fig as well is going to be 3.17. Cool. So what do we have now? Um, ah, state the units. Okay, so this is a bit of a standard uh, large data set thing. Wind speed is measured in knots, essentially. So this is going to be 3.17 knots. Cool. The means and standard deviations of the daily mean wind speed for the other months from the large data set for Camborn in 1987 are given in table two below. The data are not in month order. Using your knowledge of the large data set, suggest giving a reason which month had a mean of 11.57. Okay. Look at the different means here. 11.57 is definitely the highest, isn't it? You know, you get 7, 8, 8, 8, and then 11. It's a significant amount higher which basically means it's windier, isn't it? Like the, the average wind speed is higher, so it's a windier day, windier month. So essentially, it's very tough to remember exactly which months this table has, you know, in the large data set for Camborn in 1987, which is tough. Um, so if you do remember that, fantastic. If you don't, you might be able to at least bag the kind of explaining mark, which is really like, you would expect there to be higher wind speed, you know, gustier, windier days, getting onto like the autumn and winter months, won't you? You generally expect more wind in winter than in summer. So basically the winteriest month that you get for this data, which as I said, you either will remember or you won't, it's very tough, but it's October essentially. But then you might be able to at least bag the mark if you don't get October, you know, because you know, you would expect the higher wind speed, um, you know, to be in the autumn winter months. Sweet. That's part C. Yeah, large data set ones are tough. Like, there's really not much I can sit here and tell you to help you with these questions apart from you need to know what's on the data set. So I'm sorry I can't help you out more with that one. Part D says the data for these months are summarized in the box plots on the opposite page. But not in month order or the same order as in table two. State the meaning of the star symbol on some of the box plots. Let's get these box plots up here. Okay, so, you know, we've got all of these different, they're not in order, but, you know, it's this A to E. Um, basically, stars are these things here. They're, they're outside of the main kind of box plots. They're basically just outliers. Literally an outlier, that's, that's all you need. And then, you know, there might be some rule to define outliers, like, I don't know, 1.5 times the interquartile range greater than the upper quartile is an outlier and you pay it off, basically. Part two says, state giving your reasons, or suggest, sorry, giving your reasons, which of the months in table two is most likely to be summarized in the box plot marked Y. Okay, so, we're not gonna know this for certain, by the way, we get mean and standard deviation in the table. We don't get these on the box plots, but we can at least get data that you could expect to be related. So we get median on the box plot. So we can at least look at the median of Y and say, is it big, is it small? The median is what, I don't know, about seven, you know, just between six and eight. That's not meaning to say that the mean is about that, but at least, you know, you could reasonably expect it to be at least similar. So for example, you really wouldn't expect it to be E. E has a mean of 11.57, right? I'd probably expect this one to be E because that's got much higher median, which should at least loosely be related to the mean. So we know it's kind of got a pretty low mean here, right? Or we could expect it to have a low mean. We could also expect probably, it's gonna be something to do with the standard deviation. So when we're drawing box plots, we can pie off outliers. But when we're calculating the standard deviation, that's included in the calculation for that. Standard deviation is kind of a measure of like spread and range. Look how far this is away. 
It's got a massive range, hasn't it? It's like this and then that. Meaning that you would probably expect the standard deviation to be quite high here. You would expect to have a relatively low mean. Relatively low mean and a higher standard deviation. Therefore, I'd suggest, so let's have a look. Let's see if we can get like low mean, high standard deviation in any of these. It's clearly not E because the mean's massive. It's clearly not A because the standard deviation's quite low. So you really have B, C, and D. Uh, what, which has got the highest standard deviation here? B. And then B has also got the lowest mean there. So yeah, I think B would be a great choice, basically. Uh, therefore, B, <laughs> essentially, because, yeah, you know, the fact that the median is low would lead you to, you know, probably think that the mean is low. The fact that you have this outlier over here would lead you to suggest that the standard deviation is high. So those two pieces of information lead me to month B. Last question of stats. A biased spinner can only land on one of the numbers, one, two, three, or four. The random variable X represents the numbers that the spinner lands on after a single spin. The probability that X is R is the same as the probability that X is R plus two for R equals one and two. That looks confusing, but it actually isn't. Like, put R equals one into that. That's just telling me that the probability that X is one is the same as the probability that X is three. Put R equals two into that, and it just tells me that the probability that X is two is the same as the probability that X is four. So that's not actually too crazy, is it? We're told the probability that X is two and we want a complete distribution of x. So what is a complete distribution? It's basically, it wants all of the different values x can be, and it wants the corresponding probability that our random variable x is equal to that value. So this is what it wants. So what are the different values x can be? Well, we're told it can be one, two, three, or four, right? So all we need is just the probability of each of these things. We know the probability of 2 is 0.35. We know the probability of 4 is the same as that. How are we going to get these? Well, the probability of everything must be equal to 1. So if this, first of all, we know that these are the same, whatever it may be. So if you call that Q, we know that Q plus 0.35 plus Q plus 0.35 must equal 1, right? 0.35 plus 0.35 is 0.7. So if I take 0.7 from both sides, I'm going to have 0.3 here. I'm going to have 2q here. So q must equal 0.15. In other words, the probability of it being 1 or 3 is 0.15 and 0.15. Sweet. Ambro, Ambro, Ambra, Ambra. Spins the spinner 60 times. Find the probability that more than half of the spins land on the number four. Uh, I think it's another binomial, isn't it? Because each time you spin the spinner, you can either land on the number four or not. You then repeat this experiment 60 times. So we almost have this, let's call it Y, binomial distribution with 60 trials and the probability of it will success in this case would be landing on the number four, would it not? We know the probability of that is 0.35. Okay, so essentially the probability that more than half of the spins, in other words, I want the probability that y is greater than or equal to 31. So all I need to do here, again, my calculator doesn't give me these probabilities, but it does give me less than or equal to probabilities. So if I do that, I think, I'll be laughing here. So get it out, get it out. Menu seven, binomial CD, variable, X is 30, N is 60, P is 0.35. That gets me an absolutely mega probability, by the way. Like 99411 dot, 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 dot. So if I do one minus answer, I'm gonna get, whoa, that is tiny. So my calculator is telling me it's like 5.889 blah de blah times 10 to the minus three. Okay, so let's go let's go three sig fig here. This is going to be 0.00 
Five, eight, nine. It's a three sig fig. Absolutely tiny. Does it make sense that it's so tiny? Probably. Because the probability of it landing on a four is like 35%. So it's quite unlikely that it's going to more than half of them land on a four, given that it's only 35%, right? And then given that the sample size is so big, you're going to kind of like naturally regress down to the mean. That's why it's just so unlikely that this is going to happen. Uh, and that's part B. So part C, the random variable y equals 12 over x. Find the probability that y minus x is less than or equal to 4. Oh, that's a bit funky, isn't it? So essentially, just, it's quite hard to work out a probability with two unknowns in it, right? So why don't we just substitute that y into this probability? So this inequality would say that y minus x is less than or equal to 4. That must be the same thing as 12 over x minus x being less than or equal to 4, right? Now, x can only be 1, 2, 3, or 4, meaning it's positive, meaning I can multiply this inequality by x and not worry about flipping this sign over. So this would be 12 minus x squared is less than or equal to 4x. It's quadratic, unfortunately, for you. So we're going to get everything on one side. So I'm going to do x squared plus 4x minus 12 is greater than or equal to 0. Mate, this is like pure maths. So essentially, let's factorize this. Uh, I believe I could do plus 6 and minus 2. This is genuinely pure maths. This is actually quite grim because we need the critical values here. So essentially, the values that x would be if we were just solving this as an equation. In other words, if this was equal to 0, then I would get x is minus 6 and x equals 2. What we now do is we think about kind of what the sketch of y equals this thing would look like. Well, it would hit a minus 6 and 2. So that would be 2 and that would be minus 6. And then we say, when is this thing greater than or equal to 0? It would be this, because this is, you know, above the x-axis, above the 0, and it would be here. So the only ways that this inequality is satisfied is if x is greater than or equal to 2, right, on the right of it, or if x was less than or equal to minus 6 on the left of it. We know that x can't be less than or equal to minus 6 because it can only be 1, 2, 3, or 4. So the only way that this thing is possible is if x is greater than or equal to 2. And at this point, this is quite easy because we have the distribution for x, don't we? So greater than or equal to 2 is essentially 2, 3, or 4. So 0 0.35, 0 0.15, 0 0.35. That's the only possibility, isn't it? So it's going to be 0.35 plus 0.15 plus 0.35. This is going to be 0.7. Add a 0.15. That is going to be 0.85. And that should do the job for statistics. And we're on to the mechanics. Easy as that. So it basically says, unless otherwise indicated, wherever a numerical value of g is required, take it as 9.8 and give your answer to two or three sig figs. Sick. Okay. A man throws a tennis ball into the air so that at the instant when the ball leaves his hand, the ball is two meters above the ground and is moving vertically upwards with a speed of nine meters a second. So he, he gives it this initial velocity of nine going upwards. The motion of the ball is modeled as that of a particle moving freely under gravity, classic. And the acceleration is 10. Okay, so this is one of those times where it is otherwise indicated. We're not taking G as 9.8, we're taking it as 10. Hits the ground T seconds after leaving our mate's hand. Find the value of T. So, two meters above the ground, yeah? Here's the ground. Here's two meters. Starts its journey up here, right? And then it goes boom. And then what's going to happen? It's going to kind of go up. It's going to reach some point and then it's going to go down and hit the ground. So if we were to set a SUVAT equation up for this whole bit of motion, let's think about what's going to happen. So let's take up as positive, kind of makes sense, right? So here's the thing. Initially, he's throwing it upwards and it has a velocity going upwards. So my initial velocity is going to be positive because it's going up and it's going to be nine as we're told. Final velocity, I'm not going to know. Acceleration is going to be due to gravity, but is it going to be going up or down? Well, gravity is always trying to pull you down towards the Earth, and that given we, we've taken up as positive, this acceleration is going to be negative. What's S going to be? I start my journey here, and then I end my journey here, two meters 
down. So my S is going to be minus 2 because I've displaced 2 meters downwards. Sick. I've got enough information to get T now, haven't I? All I need to do is use the equation that doesn't have V in it. And that equation is S equals UT plus a half AT squared. All I need to do is solve this for T now. So S is minus 2. U is 9. So this is technically going to be this big T now, isn't it? Plus a half times minus 10 T squared. I just need to solve this equation. So a half times minus 10 is 5, minus 5, not 5. Uh, let's just, it looks quadratic, doesn't it? Let's stick it all onto one side. So I'm going to get 5t squared minus 90, minus 2 equals 0. Why don't I just use my calculator? The less effort, the better. So I'm going to go to menu. I'm going to go to equation funk. I'm going to go to polynomial degree 2 because it's quadratic. And put the coefficients in. So they're going to be 5, minus 9, and minus 2. And that gets me my first solution as 2, and my second one as minus 1 over 5. So given that t represents a time, which one is it going to be? It's going to be the positive one, isn't it? So t is going to be 2 here. Is it 2s for 2 seconds? It's actually not, is it? Because t is just the value. It says the ball hits the ground t seconds. So t itself is just the numerical value, and then they say seconds later. So t is 2. 7. Ugh, looks massive, man. All right. Train travels along a straight horizontal track between two stations A and B. Starts at rest from A and moves with constant acceleration. It then moves with constant velocity before moving with constant deceleration coming to rest at B. Okay. So we're going to want to state the value of the constant velocity of the train, the time for which it's decelerating, and the sketch of velocity time graph. Ugh. Okay. So... I'm actually going to sketch the velocity time graph first because then it's just a really good way for us to, you know, get an understanding of what the about what's kicking off in this question. I'm so good at not swearing on YouTube. Right, so it starts at A at rest. So we know that for a velocity time graph, it's going to start at the origin here. It then accelerates with a constant acceleration. So that's just going to correspond to a straight line going upwards. It's not a curve because the acceleration is constant. It's then going to have a constant velocity for some amount of time. And then it's going to have a deceleration, isn't it? So I don't know, whatever that deceleration happens to be like that. Obviously, this isn't to scale or whatever. I'm literally just drawing some lines. So what do we need to do? This, you know, it kind of this is station B and then this is station A. So what do we know here? Well, the first thing is it moves with constant acceleration at the start for 80 seconds. So this here, let's go a different color here. This would be 80 seconds. Uh, constant acceleration, uh, B. we don't know any other times. I suppose it would be nice if we knew this and it'd be nice if we knew this. Okay, let's see what part I is actually asking us. It's asking us for the value of the constant velocity, so whatever this value happens to be here, right? We can work that out because we know the acceleration and we know the time it accelerates for. So thinking about it like this, right? The acceleration is going to be the gradient of this. So this velocity, if you think of the acceleration, right? Change in y over change in x, change in velocity over change in time. If we rearrange that, this velocity is just going to be 80 multiplied by the gradient or multiplied by 0.3. So we're going to find what that out is. That is going to be 80 times 0.3, 24, right? So this here is going to be 24, and that is going to be my answer to part 1. Um, and that's meters per second, right? Second part. State the time for which the train is decelerating, okay? Well, now I know for this deceleration section, I know it's starting velocity and it's final velocity, right? So it's final velocity is zero. So it's basically, if I'm decelerating at a rate of 0.5 meters per second per second, um, and I need to get from 24 to zero, how am I going to work out how long that's going to take? Well, think about it. Think about it in terms of a gradient, right? It's going to be change in y, so 24, 
over change in x. So the change in x, that's going to be that time that we want, and that is going to equal this 0 0.5. So if I want my value of t, you know, however long this is decelerating for, it's going to be 24 over 0 0.5, or 48 seconds. Meaning that this chunk here, not necessarily this, but this chunk, is 48 seconds, right? Sick. And then sketch a velocity time graph. I mean, pff, there's not much else I can do apart from that, right? That looks okay. Um, the total distance between the two stations is 4,800 meters. Okay, I think I'm now gonna be able to get some more unknowns here. Using the model, find the total time taken by the train to travel from A to B. Okay, so we only really need to know, like we've got this time, we've got that time. We only really need that time. But let's have a think of this in kind of a big, high-level approach, right? We've been given the distance. So here's the thing. Um, if we've been given the distance, we can work out from a velocity time graph the total distance travelled, and it's the area under the graph. So if I work out this, this, and this in terms of areas, then I can set that equal to 4,800. The unknown here is basically whatever this happens to be. So why don't I call this big T for time? And basically that's gonna to correspond to whatever that is. So if I was to do the following, the first triangle, the area of that's gonna be half base times height. Uh, this is part B, I believe. The area of that's half base times height. So it's gonna be half times base, which is 80, times height, which is 24. The area of this rectangle is gonna be base times height, so 24 times t. The area of this is going to be half base times height, so half 48, 24. All of that must be equal to 4800. So we can see here, I've just got an equation for this value of t. So there's a lot of numbers kicking off here, but let's, let's work them out individually. So a half times 80 times 24 is 960. Half times 48 times 24 is 576. 24t still chilling there. 4800 still chilling there. We know what to do at this point, right? So 24t is going to be 4800 minus these two jobbies over here. What's that going to be? So 4800 minus 576 minus 960 is 3264 divide by 24 to get ants divided by 24 gets me 136. Am I done? Not quite, because this 136 is just this bit in yellow. So the total time is going to be 80 plus 136 plus 48. So total time is 80 plus 136 plus 48. I believe this is all like seconds, isn't it? And it's going to be what? So let's calculate this one up. And that gets me 264 seconds. Cool. Um, you know, maybe they could have asked me to get it in minutes or anything, but they're not. So it's just fine to leave it in seconds here. So just one improvement that could be made to the model of the motion of the train from A to B in order to make the model more realistic. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I suppose there's a... I think the main thing is, look how jagged this is, right? Like, do you really expect the train to just have an absolutely perfectly constant acceleration and then just instantly go to this constant velocity and then instantly go through to a constant deceleration and just perfectly stop like that? Probably not, right? Like in reality, it might be a bit more, a bit more curved, or you know, some kind of other curve like this. You might have a little jagged bump. Or it's very unrealistic to just be perfect like that. So I would probably say one way is given try and give it a variable acceleration, right? Assume that the acceleration probably isn't going to be exactly the same. And um, you know, there are a lot of things that are going to happen in the real world. For example. As I get faster, I'm gonna have more like resistive forces, right? You know, like air resistance increases a lot as I get faster. So if I'm giving it a certain amount of force, 
then maybe my acceleration is going to slow down as I get faster. You know, it's very unlikely for it to be perfectly constant. So I would say here, just give it a variable acceleration and that should probably be a bit more realistic. What we got here, a particle P moves along the X axis. At time T seconds, the displacement X is given by all of that. Find the times when it's instantaneously at rest. Okay, this is playing on the fact that if I have a displacement, so X in this case, if I differentiate that with respect to time, I'm gonna get velocity, okay? So in other words, V is gonna be dx by dt. Let's work that out quickly. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just simplify x slightly so it's a bit easier to differentiate. I'm just gonna multiply this bracket out. So I'm gonna get a quarter, not a quarter, a half t to the four, and then a half times minus two is minus one, and then I've got t cubed, and then plus a half t squared. Okay. Let's, uh, no, that's just minus one, sorry. Um, let's differentiate this, okay? So V is therefore gonna be what? Bring the four down, I'm gonna get two T cubed minus three T squared plus T. Okay, why do I want the velocity? Because if something is at rest, its velocity or speed is zero, isn't it? So to find the times when this thing is at rest, I can just set this velocity equal to zero. So I can take a T out of this to get 2t squared minus 3t plus 1 is 0. I can then factorise this, can't I? And I think if I was to do 2t and t minus 1 and minus 1, that should sort me out, shouldn't it? Because I'd get 2t squared minus 2t minus t plus 1. Sick. Okay. That gives me three values of t, doesn't it? It gives me t is naught, t is a half, and t is 1. Good. Okay. Let's have a look at part b. Total distance traveled by t in the time interval 0 to 2. I think we could use part A to help us here. Because if we were to work out, you know, you've kind of got these, it's just moving along this line, isn't it, back and forth. If we were to work out the distances, or the, you know, the position, the x position, at these times, and maybe at 2 as well, we might get an idea of what's happening here. So look at this initial thing. I'm going to basically say, okay, you know what? Let's do a little table here because it's probably going to get a bit much, isn't it? So if I was to do different T values and corresponding X values, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of graphically represent that. I would love to know the value of X at naught, a half, one, and two. This should be relatively easy, okay? So if T is zero, shove that into X. You've got a T squared coming out, so that's going to be zero. If t is a half, let's work this out. So this is going to be, uh, so t is a half, so x when t is a half is going to be a half times a half squared times a half squared minus 2 times a half. Oh, it's massive, isn't it? Plus 1. Put all of this in. So I'm going to get a half times a half squared times by a half squared minus 2 times a half plus one, which gets me one over 32. Okay, so when t is a half, this is gonna be one over 32. Let's work out x when t is one. So this is gonna be what? A half times one squared, times one squared minus two times one plus one. Um, look at this in here. This is one minus two plus one. So it doesn't matter what that is, that's zero. So this is gonna be zero meaning that it's going to be back to zero when t is one. Let's work out the value of x when t is two. And then we can kind of try and get a bit of an idea about what's kicking off. So this is going to be a half times two squared times two squared minus two times two plus one. Okay, so two squared is four times that by a half, I get two. It's going to be four minus two. 4 plus 1, so that's going to be 1, so it's going to be 2. Okay, so at t equals 0, x is at 0. Makes sense. So it's right here. It then goes to 1 over 32, doesn't it? It then is instantaneously at rest, and we can see that at 1 second, it's back to 0. So what it's going to do is it's going to go back here, isn't it? It goes 1 over 32 this way, then 1 over 32 that way and now I'm here, and then it goes to two 
over here, doesn't it? At two seconds. So what's the total distance going to be? It's going to be 1 over 32 coming this way, plus 1 over 32 going back there, plus 2 going all here. So that's just going to be what? 2 lots of 1 over 32 plus 2, 33 over 16. And that is going to be in... We just... Uh, meters, there we go. X meters. Fantastic. Let's have a look at part C. Show that... P will never move along the negative x-axis. Okay. So I suppose we just need to show that x is never going to be negative, right? Because... This is this x-axis, you know, we've shown that it's moving all along here. We just want to show that it never goes this way. And that's just negative x values, isn't it? So, if we were to show that x is always positive, we're sweet here. But look at this. Look at the initial way we've been given x. It's a half t squared. I like t squareds because squared numbers are always positive. And then I have t squared minus 2t plus 1. Wouldn't it be nice if this was a square number as well? I think it is. Is this not t minus 1 squared? Yeah, so here's the thing. This is a half multiplied by t, t minus 1, all squared. A half multiplied by a squared number always has to be greater than or equal to 0. Therefore, it's never going to be negative. Well, on the last question already, what a time to be alive. It says, two small balls, p and q, have masses 2m and km respectively, where k is less than 2. So what is the significance of k being less than 2? It tells us that q is lighter than p, doesn't it? So attached at the ends of a string, pass over fixed pulley, held it where, string taut, hang about, yeah, all the classic stuff. Release somewhere, so we can measure from p downwards, blah, 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 with an acceleration of 5g over 7. Okay. Freely, and inextensible, all that stuff. Cool. Using the model, find, in terms of m and g, the tension in the string. Okay, so it's a pulley's question. Get your forces down, and I'm telling you now, you're going to be sweet. So, we've always got tensions pulling these things up, haven't we? You know, regardless of if the particle itself is moving downwards, the string is always trying to pull it up. And then we always have the weights. So it's going to be 2mg going down here and kmg going down here. Find in terms of mg the tension in the string. Okay, so we know that p moves downwards with an acceleration magnitude of 5g over 7. So if I was to f equals ma on p, what would I get? So f equals ma. Now this f is the resultant force, and given that p is going downwards, the resultant force is going to be everything going down minus everything going up. And that is going to equal its mass, which is 2m, multiplied by its acceleration, which we're told is 5g over 7. Okay, what is taking it down? 2mg. What's taking it up? Tension. So rearrange this. This is going to be 10mg over 7. I am now going to bring the tension to the right-hand side and the 10mg over 7 to the left-hand side. It's going to get me 2mg minus 10mg over 7 equals tension. Now, this might look a bit grim, but it's all right because they're both mg terms. So if you were to think of like taking the mg out, we can simplify it because the number we're just going to be left with is 2 minus 10 over 7. So what's that going to be? Get it into your calculator. That's going to be 4 over 7. So my tension here is going to be 4 over 7 mg. Cool. Explain why the acceleration of q also has magnitude 5g over 7. Well, basically, this string, we're told it's like inextensible, right? So if the string is inextensible, if you think about it, this is inextensible, right? It's a pen. If I'm holding both ends of the pen and I just pull with this hand, then what's going to happen to this hand? It's just going to go with it, isn't it? The motion of these two hands, if they're just holding onto this pen, are completely connected, right? If this goes to the right by 10 centimeters, so does this, etc. They're just completely connected. If the string was extensible, so it was like an elastic band, it could be the case that I'd pull this hand, but then this hand would stay still because instead of this just pulling the hand, it could just stretch the elastic band, right? So if I have an inextensible string, then the motion is just completely connected, isn't it? So I would literally just say here, look, the string is inextensible. You know, so... Just the motion or acceleration, 
you know, acceleration is going to be the same, essentially. I don't think you really need to say anything else there. They're connected, it's inextensible, they're just, there's no way that they're not going to move together. Uh, part C says find the value of K. Okay, so there's a piece of information we've not cashed in yet, and that is the fact that we've not done F equals MA on Q. So we're going to have to do that. So if I was to do F equals MA on Q, now Q is moving upwards. So it's going to be everything taking it up minus everything taking it down is equal to MA. Let's quickly look at the diagram again. Up is tension, down is KMG. So if I was to do T minus KMG equals M, which we know to be KM, A, which we know to be 5G over 7, it's the same acceleration. Do we know tension? We do, we went down in the last part, that's 4 over 7. It has the same tension as well because it's the same inextensible string. So if I have 4 over 7 MG minus KMG equals KMG, well, 5 KMG over 7, can I simplify? Well, there's an MG in everything here, isn't it? So I can go chow, 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 which leaves me with 4 over 7 minus K equals 5K over 7. Add K to both sides. I'm going to get 4 over 7. So K and then 5 over 7 plus 1. So what's 5 over 7 plus 1? 1 is 7 over 7, so that's 12 over 7. Multiply by 7 and then divide by 12 to get k is 4 over 12 or 1 third. Sick. Identify one limitation of the model that will affect the accuracy of your answer to part C. Uh, well, I suppose the model doesn't take account of the mass of the string at all, does it? And that is definitely going to affect things. You know, think about all of these forces that we're saying, you know, act here. I'm doing, you know, F equals MA and all of that stuff. But if there was a mass kind of pulling down, which there would be, a, in reality, a very small one, it's going to slightly affect these calculations, isn't it? F equals MA, but there's, we've not really taken account of every single force here. So I'd say that. I'd say it doesn't take account, or one limitation, yeah, it doesn't take account of the mass of the string. There's a few, there's a few options there. That's the one that I would go for in this case. I actually think that we're sorted already. Again, not too crazy, which is good. Definitely prefer the mechanics to the stats, not going to lie to you. But yeah, um, if there were any questions that you didn't get there, let me know. Um, I might have gone through it a bit quickly, so we'll see. Let me know. But um, if there's any other things you'd like to see as well, let me know in the comments. I'm here. I'm here to make some, make some videos about that. <laughs> see you in the next one.